When I graduated from college, on my graduation day, my godfather gave me a little uh, Agfa Silet 35mm camera, uh, fairly cheap, um, not a single lens reflex, just an ordinary consumer camera. And of course, um, as soon as I graduated, he was no longer my godfather because I was grown up. So that was his sort of leaving present. And I'd never really taken any photos before, except the occasional snapshots. And I started to get interested in, in photography. Um, so in my first job, I had time off in the evenings, because it was a daytime job. And I started to teach myself photography. I started to learn how to see and how to get into a visual aesthetic, if you like. Um, I did that for a couple of years while I was doing my job, and then I had sent some photographs of children at the Henry Moore exhibition to The Guardian. And I thought no more of it, and then a few weeks later, a check came through the door and bounced on my doormat, and I thought, oh, what's this? And I realised that I'd actually got paid for taking some pictures. Meanwhile, the other part of my life, my, my regular job, it got to be rather boring and a, bit, a, bit, um, a little bit hair-raising. And I decided to leave that and to come to London to be a photographer, solely on the basis of four pictures published in what was then the Manchester Guardian. Um, I knew some people in London uh, and one of them knew a photographer who was looking for an, an assistant, a commercial photographer. So I went to see this guy. He was a very nice guy called Tommy Walls. He'd been a photographer for the army in, in the war. And he did some work for the Radio Times and some other stuff. And he employed me as an assistant on a very modest wage, but he was a very easygoing person. He taught me about darkroom photography. So after doing that for about a year, I started to pull in freelance work, which he allowed me to do in his, in his dark room. And slowly I built up work for myself until suddenly there I was a fully fledged freelance photographer trying to make a living in Fleet Street. And the point of view being that you don't need to get paid necessarily in order to do something. But if you do something and you stick to it, you may eventually land up by getting paid. So professionalism is really a state of mind rather than a state of income. And I found it quite easy to adopt that state of mind, probably because uh, I hadn't learned that there are some things that are difficult to do in life. When you're young, you often you do the impossible because you, you don't always know that it is impossible. We didn't have business plans in those days. When I first came to London, I found myself in a rich cultural milieu. Uh, with experimentation going on in all sorts of fields, from sex to sculpture, from music to who knows what, all sorts of things, poetry. And um, I really liked all these extracurricular things. And when I got a chance, I, I, I would take my camera with me and I would take pictures of all sorts of people, friends, people that I didn't know, doing what, what they did, being um, musicians or poets or sculptors or giving speeches or all, all, all sorts of things. And um, I suppose that if you look at the themes in, the, in this exhibition, they represent the, uh, the main areas of interest that I had then when in my in my relative youth, and uh, and I photographed them. If you look at all the overall subject areas that, that I covered when I was taking pictures, um, it spanned really quite a wide range of um, cultural, political stuff, and personal, of course. Um, there was poetry. There was jazz. There was rock and roll. Um, there was painting and sculpture. There was uh, the politics of the street. 
and the, the CND and Committee of 100 Marches, which have their counterpart today in, in Marches Against the War. I used to work quite a lot for Peace News because I like the politics of peace. And in fact, um, the, the editors of Peace News that I, that I worked under, one was Tom McGrath, another uh, was Adam Roberts. They taught me a great deal about uh, journalism and photojournalism and how, how to behave as a journalist. And although I only ever got paid expenses by Peace News because they didn't have any money, the benefit that I derived from being able to work for them was really a lot because I, I was able to... They, they allowed me to learn, if you like, by, by paying for my time. I was working for the Sunday Times who regarded me as uh, some sort of political photographer. And I, when I worked for the Observer, they would send me up in airplanes to, um, uh, to, to do aerobatics and that sort of stuff. I mean, then there was the melody maker um, who employed me to shoot uh, mainly rock and roll and jazz. It's, it's as if um, each, each different photographic client that I had thought I was a different sort of photographer. I got a commission from a publisher called Anthony Blonde, who was a fairly avant-garde publisher, to take pictures to illustrate a book uh, about the weird things in London, and, or weird, unusual uh, fringe, that sort of thing. And uh, one of the things I, I chose to fulfill that commission was the bikers who were centred around two clubs. One was the Ace Cafe on the North Circular Road. The other was the 59 Club in Paddington, which was run by a vicar or a priest, a guy in a dog collar. And I spend a few evenings photographing in both of those places. The, the bikes themselves were really quite friendly. At first sight, they looked rather tough and menacing, but actually it turned out that most of that impression had been generated in my mind by the press, by the media. It turned out when, when I got to relate to those people, they were really quite friendly. And if you look at their faces, you can see uh, there's very little aggression there at all. It's worth remembering that these were the days when mods and rockers would fight it out on Brighton Beach. There was a deal of antagonism between these two opposing groups. Um, but none of this seemed to filter through to the, the bikers in, from the Ace Cafe and the 59 Club, who are, if you like, genuine enthusiasts. I think the... I can't imagine any of them going to Brighton Beach and having, a, having fisticuffs. Nonetheless, later in the decade, after I'd finished taking pictures, um, the, the Hells Angels started to come into prominence. But they, they were the British version of the Hells Angels, not the American version. And they didn't drive around shooting people up with blunderbusses or whatever it is, um, or killing people at Altamont. They, although they could be a little bit rough, um, I think the, the psychedelic generation took the uh, English Hells Angels to heart. And if you look at the footage, the video and the film that was shot at some of those um, free festivals in, in the park, in Hyde Park in London, you'll see the uh, Hells Angels behaving really quite, uh, quite peacefully.